Welcome to all. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today at the 15th AFD Conference on Development uh, on the theme of uh, strong sustainability. I welcome you people in the room and people online. Uh, we're expecting uh, approximately uh, 1,500 uh, people over those three days. So thank you for your participation. Last February, 1,040 scientists call on the presidential candidates and the media to move away from the rhetoric of inaction in the face of environmental crisis. 50 years after the publication of the Meadows report, after six GIEC reports, 27 COP on climate and almost 15 COP on biodiversity, the challenges of ecological, of ecological transition remain largely unresolved. In that context, the research community mobilizing is paramount to keep informing, alerting, and triggering public actions. AFD is part of this momentum, and it has been coordinating numerous research programs on ecological transitions, inequalities, and the commons for several years, aiming at feeding policy dialogue. Since 2003, it has also organized 14 international research conferences on a range of development issues, gathering public and private actors, the academic community, and the policymakers. In a highly deteriorated geopolitical and multilateral context, where economic and social crises are worsening and are coupled with ecological and democratic concerns, it is vital to renew and strengthen the dialogue between the academic and political communities. This conference aims at contributing to it. The 15th edition of the International Research Conference is devoted to strong sustainability. It will focus on the processes and instruments for building net zero trajectories and possible ways of ensuring a just ecological transition that does not preempt the development of the poorest countries. These topics are at the heart of AFD's intervention strategy. First, they are part of the orientation given to the research activities in a desire to achieve all SDGs. Second, they are contributing to the dialogue on public policies while mobilizing multidisciplinary approaches. Concerning the net zero trajectories, the collective vision of the targets to reach seems clear limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2050. However, since the Paris Agreement and the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, two observations remain unchallenged. First, governments in the South and the North are struggling to meet the requested greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Currently, the thumb of the national determined contribution would result in emission twice the amount recommended by the IPCC and to global warming to 2.5 degrees by the end of the century. The recent COP27 didn't come out with reinforced ambition on mitigation efforts. Today's conference proposes to rethink the trajectories to follow and the condition to meet to better support countries to reach their commitment and implementation their mitigation and adaptation action plan. The second observation is that if the global objective of balancing emission on one side and absorption on the other is essential, the challenge of tomorrow are also beyond net zero. The, they, they require that the current net zero action plans take a greater consideration of four issues. First, the social dimension of the climate change. Second, the macroeconomic constraints. Third, the geopolitical context at work. And finally, the biodiversity issue. Strong sustainability with its more holistic methodological framework meets these requirements. Yesterday night, the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity has opened in Montreal under the Chinese presidency. The COP intends to agree on a new global biodiversity framework and set targets to building global actions until 2040 to protect and restore nature. AFD, with this 15th International Research Conference, 
on strong sustainability is extending this call for the preservation of nature. The strong sustainability approach is gradually gaining ground and is now at the heart of current debates in the face of increasing calls for greater integration of biodiversity and climate issues. For many developing and emerging economies, strong sustainability is becoming a reality. These countries have a large share of the world's biological diversity. The inappropriate use of land and fish resources, the accelerated de de degradation of habitats and natural resources seriously threatens public health and the population's quality of life due to polluting effects. As in developed economies, issues of inequality are central to public discussions, among which just an added transition. Many of these countries are also highly dependent on extraction revenue such as hydrocarbon or metals to finance public policies. This context highlights a tension between climate and biodiversity objective on one side and fiscal and trade stability on the other. In the face of these multidimensional challenges, and I did not even mention the issue of finance and financial stability, Policymakers and academics started to perceive the strong sustainability approach as a promising way to achieve their new emission reduction commitment while reducing socio-economic inequalities and preserving the country's cultural and natural biodiversity. The notion, however, is not new. Strong sustainability has been linked to ecological economics since the 1990s but it has recently been reinvested in other disciplines. This is one of the reasons why the conference program is eclectic and lies at the crossroad of several sciences. I want to take this opportunity to greet and thank the development experts, economists, philosophers, demographers, sociologists, and climatologists from the South and the North who are present here and online for their participation and mobilization this event would not take place without the input. Let me come now to the conference objective. It is threefold. First, to present the state of multidisciplinary research on strong sustainability and its consideration in public policies. Second, to raise awareness of the strong sustainability approach and assess the viability of the different trajectories that stem from this vision. Finally, beyond sharing knowledge on strong sustainability trajectories, the objective is to provide concrete recommendations for the public and the private sector to operationalize this notion. Still too often, strong sustainability remains a vague concept. I will mention here only two reasons why the strong sustainability approach can shed new lights on the construction of developmental trajectories and why it offers promising avenues to consistently guide a just ecological transition. First, by recognizing the non-sustitutability of different types of capital, economic, natural, and social capital, strong sustainability contributes to revalorizing the fights against climate change and the preservation of biodiversity in the process of building development trajectories. Needless to say that the SDG 13, 14, and 15 of the 2030 agenda need to catch up. This strong sustainability approach is recognizing the uniqueness of natural capital and can contribute to greater articulation of these targets by providing a long-term vision. Secondly, strong sustainability is concerned with social justice. It Simultaneously, sorry, considers macroeconomic constraints and the need to respect the biophysical limits of our planet. This reconciliation of environmental, social, and economic knowledge offer a new hope, breaking the thematic silos of decision making via the development of multidimensional indicators in science. In order to move from the narrative to implementation, the development of multidimensional tools for defining and measuring strong sustainability trajectories is crucial. 
I will here briefly dwell upon four examples of tools we are implementing at AFD. First, the macroeconomic modeling tool GEM, stemming for general, monetary, and multisectoral macrodynamic for the ecological shift, that's all, assesses <laughs> the dynamic macroeconomic and financial impacts of ecological transition in a given country. We have conducted, conducted GEM project together with local authorities in many countries. Uh, that I can cite Vietnam, um, Morocco, Colombia, uh, and Tunisia, and we are start, starting the discussion in India and, uh, and Mexico. Another example of the model is STEAM, stemming from exposure to structural transition in an ecological economic model. This model identifies the macroeconomic risks that for that developing countries may face in their ecological transition based on the analysis of the produ production structure of the country and its integration into value chain. For example, in Uzbekistan, we analyzed in collaboration with the government the macro-structural vulnerabilities that a low carbon transition could generate by assessing the country's dependency on such set industries along three dimensions that could hinder this transition external, fiscal, and socioeconomic dimensions. Third, the environmental sustainability gap tools is an indicator that monitors the state of the various components of critical natural capital. In New Caledonia, for example, in partnership with WWF and the Ecolo Ecological Accounting Chair, we have supported the implementation of this framework. Above all these tools, we are also relying on inequality diagnosis, which via multidimensional indicators, analyze how different types of inequalities overlap and reinforce each other. I mention here that the inequality and social link was the topic of the 13th AFD International Research Conference in 2018. Finally, governance is key and AFD has investigated extensively the comments as the way to propose innovative governance structure and overcome current limitations observed in the implementation of ecological policies. Here again, I mentioned that the articulation between common and development was a topic of the 12th AFD International Research Conference in 2016, and you can refer to the website of the AFD to have details and, and, and the papers associated to those two conferences. This range of technical tools serve the same purpose, mobilizing the commons to steer development trajectories under strong sustainability. This topic requires polycentric approaches in governance scale. So let's come now uh, to the running of these next three days. They will include academic and strategic presentation and feedback from actors in the field leaving plenty of room for debates. The program is structured around three strong sustainability principles proposed by AFD, which aim to guide the development of trajectories. First, non-substitutability or partial substitutability between capital, second, multidimensionality, and third, the social construct of the good states reconciling environmental, social, and economic knowledge. We propose four plenary and 13 parallel sessions on the menu for today and tomorrow. Both research papers specifically selected for the conference and research work carried out at AFD over the last few years will fit the parallel sessions. During the first plenary, we will question economists and climatologists on the interplay between their disciplines from a biophysical perspective. The notion of climate tipping points and planetary limits will be tackled as they provide a means of monitoring the environmental state of the Earth through nine interconnected thresholds, six of which have been already exceeded. The second session will gather a philosopher, a sociologist, and an ethnographer. They will question the posture of development within limits and the notion of post-development from an ontological, biophysical, and socioeconomic perspective. Sorry. In the third plenary session, economists, philosophers, and engineers will 
propose a re-reading sustainability trajectories through structural changes at a moment when developing countries face the dual challenges of industrializing and catching up while mitigating CO2, CO2 emissions. Then the final panel of experts will discuss the social dimension of ecological transitions and the notion of social constructs built around a good state, reconciling environmental, social and economic knowledge, as already mentioned. During the parallel sessions, researchers will present 38 academic papers. I would like to congratulate and greet the experts whose papers have been selected. Each paper contains recommendations for actions of various themes, such, such as energy transition, climate damage, biodiversity constraints, transition risk, governance, and ecological planning. Finally, Friday will combine academic insights, the policymakers' interventions, and civil society testimonies around methodological issues of trajectory construction, public policy dialogue, and financial instruments to carry strong sustainability trajectories. These three days bring together around 80 high-quality speakers. So this meeting is held in an hybrid format with a live broadcast of the session and the possibility for the public to intervene remotely. For all online participants, and I know, I know that uh, you are a lot, uh, do not forget uh, that you can intervene at any moment in the chat and ask questions. They will be relayed. At this stage, I would like to thank the team involved in the organization of this event. Within AFD, I address a special thanks to Antoine Godin and Annabelle Moro Santos, who were the architects of this conference. I also would like to thank Delphine Constant Perrier, Raphael Sardier, Sylvie Horry, Marine Ray, Isabelle De Dieu, Berenice Oreillo Pierronnet, and Guy Huin. I extend my thanks to our technical partners, especially Juliette Morin and Loïc Morvan from Eco Events, Matteo Dudec from Lively, and Sophie Erwin from Jean Jean Factory. They all have made this event come true. So I am now happy to leave the floor to Pamela McElwee. Pamela, you are here, yes. Um, professor. Uh, in the Department of Human Ecology at Rutgers University, New Jersey. She will open the discussion by highlighting the importance of strong sustainability approaches in development trajectories. Our presentation will focus on the complex interaction between biodiversity, climate, and society. And we tackle the issue related to transformative governance, a must have for addressing the global environmental crisis. More broadly, Pamela's research focuses on strategy for climate mitigation and biodiversity conservation. Pamela has served as a lead author for the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. She is a newly appointed co-chair of the upcoming IBES Nexus Assessment. Pamela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me today to open what I think looks like a very exciting conference. And I'm really appreciative of the goals uh, in particular, which are to develop some concrete and specific policy recommendations um, and to generate new knowledge for these strong sustainability trajectories that we know that we need, particularly focused on the developing world and, and our development challenges. Um, and these are two of the goals of the Intergovernmental Panel um, on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, as was previously introduced. And uh, I thought I might take a little bit of time this morning to talk about some of the intersections between the work that's being done here at the meeting um, and the work that's going on at IBES at, on this nexus assessment that we're, we're just beginning and that I've been very privileged to co-chair over the past year. Um, and so one of the reasons why attention to nexus issues is important 
is because it's become increasingly clear um, over the past decade that we need to address climate change and biodiversity together um, in ways that are synergistic rather than antagonistic. So in opening this morning's session, I just want to emphasize the role of biodiversity um, in our agenda, that when we're talking about climate and economy from a biophysical perspective or constructing strong sustainability trajectories, as some of our upcoming sessions today are going to focus in on, that we really keep biodiversity part of this um, uh, issue front and center in our minds. Um, and nature-based solutions and nature-positive approaches are really at the heart of the uh, biodiversity conference that just opened in Montreal yesterday as well. Um, and so I think they have really strong resonance with the questions of net zero that we're going to be focused on, on at this conference. So I particularly want to focus my talk um, on three things that I think will achieve or at least have synergies with the focus of the conference. Um, and so the, the three issues that were brought up in terms of what the conference is going to focus in on, the non-substitutability, the need for multidimensional diagnostics, um, and then thinking about the, the social construct, there's three very similar topics that our nexus assessment um, is similarly dealing with. And so I want to look at the parallels between those. And that is um, the question of how we deal with trade-offs, um, questions of integrating our governance strategies, and then finally, the ways we can use multiple knowledges and values to help us achieve these social contracts. Um, so essentially, I want to show that there's a lot of ne there's a lot of intersection between these nexus approaches and um, the strong sustainability approach. So I think next slide, please. Um, so the, the question of Earth's climate and biodiversity being connected together um, is something we're increasingly realizing. We know that climate change exacerbate risks to biodiversity, um, and at the same time, that our natural and managed ecosystems and biodiversity play a really key role in fluxes of greenhouse gases. That. There we go. Great. Thank you. So we know that 77% of land um, and 87% of the ocean have been modified by the direct effects of human activities. And so thinking about this through the planetary boundaries lens, as, as we see on the left, we know that biosphere integrity in particular is really the one of the high risk um, zones. And we're now, of course, compounding that with the, the, the impacts of climate change through the increased mean temperatures, altered precipitation, increasing frequency of extreme events, acidification of our marine environments, all of which are adversely affecting biodiversity in very complex ways, as we see on the right. And it's really these complex feedbacks between climate, biodiversity, and development that are going to lead to pronounced and often less predictable outcomes. Um, so if we ignore this sort of you know, intersection between nature, climate, and biodiversity, we're going to get non-optimal solutions. Um, and so that's one of the problems that I and I think a lot of people have potentially with the planetary boundaries framework because it doesn't reflect those intersections, right? The boundaries seem very separate when in fact we know that exceeding the biosphere integrity boundary has feedbacks on the climate boundary and vice versa. So thinking about how do we move from a planetary boundary perspective to one that recognizes those intersections um, a little bit better. I mean, if anything, COVID showed us how important those intersections are, right? That alteration of natural habitats or exposure to wildlife trade increases our risk of pandemics, which can then be exacerbated by the movement of species because of climate change, while at the same time, climate change mitigation actions might spur changes in natural habitats, such as the expansion of bioenergy. So all of these things, we have to have those interconnections. So that's why there's been a lot more attention in recent years to this idea of the nexus. There's a nexus between these sectors. And so you get a lot of different schematics um, like here, um, thinking about the nexus, for example, of water, energy, food, or climate, biodiversity development, and so forth. And these approaches are really arguing about, you know, how do we move beyond silos in how we address these intertwined problems? 
Um, but a recent review of the literature, particularly on the water, energy, um, and food nexus, found that although a lot of people are using this nexus terminology, um, there's very little detail about how we actually do it. Um, and one of the reasons for that lack of attention in detail um, is a very few specific examples of where this is actually being able to be put in practice. Very little in terms of larger scale solutions. So where there is some nexus thinking, it tends to be very localized. Um, and also a lack of assessment tools. That's a really big problem. And that's something that I think AFD in particular can play a great role. Um, what are the sort of metrics and tools for decision making that could help us with some of this nexus thinking? Um, and so similarly, there's been a lot of discussion about the SDGs as you know, the, the 17 goals and the 169 targets are supposed to be integrative, um, but they've really been criticized for failing to live up to that promise, presenting potentially conflicting goals and targets. Um, the evidence that we have to date suggests that they haven't really made um, sub substantial impacts in moving towards more integrative mechanisms. Um, and there's lots of missed opportunities within the SDGs. So for example, SDG target 15.1, which is about conservation areas, doesn't mention high carbon sink areas as a priority. Um, these challenges are similarly echoed in the post-2020 biodiversity framework that's being discussed right now in Montreal, where Targets on protected areas don't explicitly mention climate co-benefits, nor the urgent need to target climate vulnerable ecosystems. So we're replicating these silos again, where I just focusing on biodiversity and forgetting about climate. So that's one of the reasons why we at IBES were requested to um, do an assessment on nexus issues with an idea that, that it would help advise um, both biodiversity and climate conventions on how we do these things better. Um, and so this idea of a nexus assessment was really born here in Paris um, in 2019 at um, the IPBES plenary where governments requested this um, assessment to happen. These assessments have a sort of drawn out long process. There was a scoping report you know, telling us what should be in the assessment that scoping report was approved last year. Um, and so we have just started the process of finding authors and assessing literature um, in 2022. Uh, our first order draft will be open for the public to comment starting in January, so about a month away. Um, and I'd really like to encourage everyone that's here at the conference to help us by reviewing this assessment because we need your expertise, we need your inputs to make this a really useful document for governments. Um, and it will be adopted at the IPBES 11 plenary, which is uh, scheduled to be in late 2024. So we have another year and a half or so to get this right. And we could really benefit from all of your wisdom to help us do it well. So I can't unfortunately really tell you what's in the first order draft because it's not public yet and I was told don't talk about it. Um, but I will talk a little bit about three areas that my own research focuses primarily on that I'm trying to bring um, to my work in the nexus. Um, and that's these questions of trade-offs, integrated government governance, and thinking about diverse knowledge systems. So they're things we hope to, are going to be in this uh, assessment, um, and they're ones that I think really resonate across um, the themes of the conference. Um, so the first area on trade-offs, it obviously has so much um, to do with the, the questions of strong sustainability about non-substitutability, that we cannot trade off natural capital um, for other forms of capital and, and expect to not have consequences. So the World Economic Forum has estimated that about a, a $2.7 trillion investment in changing socioeconomic trajectories to nature-positive pathways would return about $10 trillion in economic growth by 2030. But how do we get there, right? Like, what is the pathway, and what are the interventions that we would actually need to invest in? Um, we have to accept that just about any intervention we make is going to induce trade-offs. Um, and so a lot of these trade-offs, unfortunately, end up being between 
interventions that we might make for climate, they'll have trade-off impacts on biodiversity. Um, the reverse is not quite as true. Most of the things that we do for biodiversity tend to be positive for the climate, which is good news. Unfortunately, a lot of the things we do for climate don't have great impacts on biodiversity. So those are the ones we really need to think about. So this is a diagram that uh, was in the um, IPCC IBBA's first joint work um, that came out in 2021. We're revising it. I was part of the writing team, um, and hopefully it will come out in science uh, early next year. But thinking about the trade-offs, and you can see the top is really things that we might do for climate, how they might impact on biodiversity. Um, anything that's red represents a potentially negative trade-off, and you can see there's quite a bit more when we're thinking about climate to biodiversity rather than the reverse. Um, but unfortunately, we know these trade-offs are going to be things we have to deal with, but we're not doing a good job of identifying them and, and trying to classify how we might reconcile them. So as one example, a recent study of ecosystem-based adaptation in particular, um, the, uh, it was a literature review assessment of, of this field, and only 16% of the articles on ecosystem-based adaptation acknowledged any possible trade-offs. So a very small number of folks are paying attention to it, even though we know that these trade-offs might happen. So there's particularly concern about trade-offs over benefits, how we might distribute benefits across stakeholders. Um, so in another recent study of ecological infrastructure projects, 72% of the cases reported positive benefits, which is a good sign, but then those benefits were not quantified as to whether or not there might be trade-offs among beneficiaries. So some people might benefit, but what might be the trade-offs? So too often studies of nature positive actions fail to discuss how different groups such as men and women or different income classes might benefit in different ways. Um, and we are starting to see, I think, some very worrying trends potentially. So there have been some recent studies that have shown that higher levels of knowledge and acceptance of nature-based solutions are found among those with higher income and education. And, and, that, and so it's sort of you know, preaching to the choir in some ways. And there's a danger of focusing just on those folks um, because the cost of nature-based solutions may be borne by others. Um, and there's some emerging experience that those trade-offs can be significant. So there's some growing literature coming from the US in particular about green gentrification showing that nature-based interventions, particularly around stormwater, which is a really interesting um, place where we're seeing a lot of green infrastructure investments, but those are having the biggest justice implications. That is, they're located in low-income areas, they um, have potential negative trade-offs for nearby housing and so forth, and those are not being built into considerations of green infrastructure, which is very worrisome. So one way we can potentially deal with this is to improve our understanding of trade-offs through really breaking them down and thinking about there's different types of trade-offs and they're gonna require different types of interventions. So one analysis that I've been trying to work on recently with colleagues at IUCN, um, because IUCN came up with a, a global standard on nature-based solutions in the last year, um, and we've been thinking about looking at examples of where those are being implemented and where trade-offs are happening and how can we break those down. Um, we're thinking about the fact that there's very different trade-offs between biophysical trade-offs, climate versus biodiversity, versus governance trade-offs how stakeholders might have different values, people have different levels of power, um, how scale and temporal trade-offs affect this over time and at different levels, um, and then specifically about how benefits are being traded off and whether or not we can come up with some principles of how to um, better manage these um, in particular. There's a couple of, I think, promising areas where we're seeing some work that I think um, has some very useful practical implications um, in recognizing that these trade-offs exist. Um, and I'll just give two quick examples from the US. Um, the first is that in the US, we have the Federal Emergency Management Agency, known as FEMA, 
This is our internal agency that helps with um, remediation re and rebuilding after disasters, hurricanes, and so forth. And FEMA has always been criticized for essentially building back in floodplains as opposed to thinking about how we might move out of floodplains and so forth. And one of the problems with FEMA investment has been that they've always used cost-benefit analysis, just plain, simple CBA. Um, and in the last year, they finally decided that communities that want to invest in nature-based solutions do not have to use CBA in their proposals. And it has been a huge change. Just the tweak in terms of analysis that is put into proposals has opened up a whole realm of possibility for new types of investments. Um, so that's one thing that's happening. Another thing that's happening in some of our federal agencies in the US is a move towards adaptive management. Um, and there's a, been an, a, a new approach known as um, resist, accept, and direct, or the RAD framework, to help uh, US federal agencies make some decisions about where ecosystem management is, it can be um, altered to resist a trajectory of change caused by climate change, where we have to just accept those changes and manage for trade-offs, or whether we can direct the changes in new ways. Um, and so these RAD frameworks are being applied um, through some participatory scenario planning in various federal um, uh, land management areas, particularly national parks in the US. And there's some really interesting studies. Um, I highly recommend one um, that, that came out recently from the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska, where they've been doing some scenario planning with local Native American communities to think about what subsistence hunting is going to look like under climate change uh, scenarios and how we might manage for those and accept some changes but resist others. And that's an explicit acknowledgement that those trade-offs have to be managed for. So this, the second thing I want to mention is, is how much we really need to think about integrative governance. It's a really important um, role. It plays a really important role in both nexus approaches and strong sustainability. We want to make sure our institutions are not siloed, that they're not working against one another. Um, and in the IPBES IPCC workshop report um, that I mentioned that came out last year, one of the things we looked at were institutional arrangements for climate and biodiversity, and there were very few institutions, and nearly all in the EU, where biodiversity, climate, and development are actually managed together. Um, it's not very common elsewhere. Um, and those silos are really hard to break down. Um, I've just come from a couple of months' work in Vietnam. I was there most of the fall. Um, and I know that AFD is doing some exciting work there as well. Um, but one of the things, one of the field sites we were working in is a, bio, a UNESCO recognized biosphere reserve in the Red River Delta, one of our major um, agricultural production zones in Vietnam. Um, and there's a biosphere reserve there to preserve wetland habitat at the mouth of one of the rivers. Um, one side of the river is managed by the Ministry of Environment as a wetland. The other side of the river is managed by the Ministry of Agriculture as a forest. Um, and they are under two totally different management regimes. Um, the side that is considered a forest and not a wetland is now being threatened with um, development because the local officials there have basically um, decided that the mangroves, which they know protect dikes, they know have an economic benefit, but those benefits tend to be hypothetical on a day-to-day -day basis, while there's immediate incentives to convert those mangroves into a industrial zone. And that's happening in a biosphere reserve. So you know these challenges are, and that's a result of siloed management. That's a direct result of siloed management. So these you know, make real differences on the ground. Um, so thinking about how to integrate governance is challenging, but we think it's really important to move towards transformative change, which is really the buzzword these days. Um, so in a paper that came out in bioscience this summer, um, Yunai Pascual and, and myself and some other folks who work with IPBES um, tried to take some case studies and think about what transformative governments, governance might look like that did a better job of thinking about multifunctionality, of integration, of including social support, having more equity built into approaches, um, and thinking about whether we could 
harness positive tipping points to try to incentivize people to work together across climate and biodiversity. Um, and in our paper, we looked at four specific case studies of red, um, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, um, fisheries reform, uh, climate adaptation in the Arctic, and then urban nature-based solutions. And across those four case studies, we tried to come up with some principles that could help us move towards more integrated, transformative um, governance. Um, and so I encourage folks, if you have a chance, to look at that paper and some of those case studies, um, because I think we're, hopefully have identified some things that can give us some, at least some research trajectories um, moving forward. So finally, my last point that I want to make is thinking about multiple knowledge systems and values. Um, and this comes from, I think, very legitimate critiques that we have tended to treat climate and biodiversity um, as very instrumental, seeing human and non-human worlds as very separate rather than in interdependent. Um, and indigenous um, communities in particular have really expressed some concerns about some of the, the terms that we use, like nexus or nature-based solutions, um, as being too instrumental and not really recognizing relational values, holistic thinking, and so forth. And so embracing different types of values, as you can see on the left, thinking about values that might represent living with rather than just living from biodiversity and nature, um, and thinking about multiple knowledge systems, like those on the right, which is from the Arente Aboriginal community from Australia. Um, thinking about multiple knowledge systems and values can help us reduce conflict and manage trade-offs, increase capacity and awareness, um, and build support for interventions across more diverse coalitions. And so this might involve thinking more about narratives of care, um, codependency, kinship, reciprocity, things we don't normally um, put into our discussions of development, um, but I think are really important because I do recognize those, those multiple knowledge systems that are out there. So applying principles and indicators that are coming from indigenous knowledge systems, things like health of the land, caring for country, reciprocal reciprocity and responsibility. These are things that I think can help us in, in moving some of those net zero trajectories forward in a less instrumental way. Um, and recognizing cultural ecosystem services, this is a big part of this as well, because those cultural ecosystem services are place-based, they're contextual, um, they can help us really improve our management um, in really interesting ways. Um, but a recent review of, of nature-based solutions in particular found that very little of the nature-based solutions um, literature, which is supposed to be integrative across climate and biodiversity, very little of it talks about indigenous knowledge and very little of it talks about what we need to do to work with uh, indigenous peoples and local communities in ways that are recognizing of this reciprocal um, relationship with nature. So one of the things that's, um, I think, exciting and moving in, in new directions is our nexus assessment, which has a mandate to include indigenous and local knowledge in the assessment we're doing. And as part of our assessment, we are doing dialogues with indigenous communities all through the assessment process. We have one coming up in January with our first order draft where we're sharing the report with indigenous communities um, at, in Thailand, actually. We're bringing in folks um, worldwide, but we're actually meeting in Thailand to talk about what the assessment can do to reflect uh, indigenous values more effectively. Um, another thing that's happened recently, just this week actually, is the Biden administration in the US has just released for the very first time um, guidance for the US federal government on how to use indigenous and local knowledge in federal decision making. And so if you go to the White House website, um, they've just released that. It's about a 50 page document. Um, and it's, it's really important because, for example, endangered species management in the US has always been based on 
basically, you know, scientific monitoring of species populations and completely ignoring the fact that we have long-standing monitoring um, in many Native American um, and other local communities as well. And that's never been built into some of the endangered species classifications. And now it can be with this new guidance. So it's, I think, a very exciting move. Um, I will say one last thing about the problem of um, sort of managing trade-offs and dealing with multiple values is our lack of tools um, to help measure how we're doing in terms of multiple values and to make sure our decision to support tools are really better reflecting multiple value systems. Um, a lot of our current decision support tools, you know, things like invest, our natural capital um, modeling and so forth, um, don't do an effective job of, of reflecting multiple values yet. They really need to be improved in those regards. Try to bring in some of these cultural ecosystem services, um, maybe build in more deliberative mechanisms. Um, that reflect local indicators. There's a lot of great work on biocultural indicators. Um, and so I think there's a wonderfully strong role for AFD in helping us develop those tools that really marry um, cultural approaches with economics and some of our more instrumental approaches in ways that can build decision support tools that are really useful on the ground at different scales. So I think that's a really exciting area. So I want to leave it at that. Um, I just wanted to open up with some food for thought um, for the conference um, to, to think about ways that nexus approaches and strong sustainability um, can be mutually beneficial because we're thinking about some of the, the same things. And I look forward to the discussions over the next few days and hope again to encourage many of you to take part in our external review of the nexus assessment. So if you go to ibbez.net slash nexus, you can sign up um, to be a reviewer once it opens up in January, and we would very much benefit from your comments. So thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Yesterday, in his opening speech, uh, the UN Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, called the end to, and I quote, the orgy of destruction that is going on right now. How do we ensure that, um, as a group, we reach sustainability on all fronts? This is the goal of the strong sustainability approach that we are developing in the coming three days. The strong sustainability approach emerges out of the debate following the publication of the Limits to Growth Report, also known as the, as the Meadows Report. This is 50 years ago. One of the key contributions of the Meadows Report is the integration of biophysical aspects and economics. The ensuing debate from economics researchers emphasized the inclusion of natural capital in the production function and whether it can be substituted with social and produce capital. This debate remains at the forefront of climate and ecological economics. Is it possible to decouple, uh, to decouple economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions or environmental footprints? The Convention on, Biodiverse, on Biological Diversity and, in the sorry, and the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services have highlighted the current erosion of biodiversity and ecosystem services, such as carbon uh, sequestration, soil stability, and the disappearance of many species. Despite the growing literature on ecosystems management, the link between economics, ecosystem services, and well-being remain debated. The first plenary session of this conference will uh, discuss these topics. How do we integrate biophysical aspects into economic thinking? Or rather, how do we ensure that economics dynamics is embedded within biophysical reality? The three distinguished speakers um, will offer three different and complementary visions of these important questions. First, we will have Antonin Potier talking about limits of economics approach to climate. He will address uh, the following questions, how climate affects the economy, what issues to do the economic damage of, sorry, what issues do the economic damage of climate change raise? Should economic damages be included in macroeconomic models?
Then Dr. Tim Linton uh, will talk about climate tipping points. Uh, Dr. Tim Linton will be um, online. Um, he will uh, address questions such as what type of causal interactions can occur between tipping points, events across different scale of systems. And we have seen with the introduction speech by, by Pamela McElwee this morning that tipping points can be either negative or positive with social tipping points uh, uh, creating a positive feedback loop. Uh, and then finally, we will have Dr. Dr. Lauriane Mouisset, who will talk about bioeconomic models to manage uh, terrestrial socio-ecological systems and address the following question, how, do, how to integrate biophysical and economic aspects to characterize uh, uncertain futures, how does the Birdland model that she will present offer uh, is different from other models, and how should we use these type of models? Each speaker will have 20 minutes. And then we will have a 30-minute uh, discussion, so please note down every question you have, uh, either online or, or in presence. For all online participants, do not, do not forget that you can interact at any time in the chat and ask for questions. Let me now introduce the first speaker. Antonin Potier is an associate professor at École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, a researcher at CIRED in Paris, and uh, Centre Marc Bloch in Berlin. His research interests um, broadly include socioeconomic consequences of climate change and mitigation, history of economic thought in relation to the environment, the role of economics in decision making, and he currently works on the interactions between social justice, inequality, and mitigation measures. Antonin, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> so, um, before beginning this talk, I would like to thank the uh, Agence Française de Développement for inviting me to this 15th International um, Research Conference on Development and for giving me the opportunity to present to you some reflection on how economics approaches climate change. So, this conference deals with um, strong sustainability. Um, so, we'll not attempt here to give a, a definition of what strong sustainability is. Uh, at this conference, I suppose we'll uh, uncover many of these aspects and we'll um, delve more into this topic in the, in the coming days. And we're only at the beginning of the conference. But um, to me, um, strong sustainability evokes several things and especially a commitment to protect some essential environmental goods. And this good can be essential for various reasons. I will not discuss that. But what is important to notice is that the economic consequences of the destruction of degradation of these goods are not the main reason why they are deemed essential. So we want to protect these goods for other reasons than economic reasons. So with this perspective in mind, um, I would like to think with you about climate change and especially economic damage from climate change. Uh, so I believe climate change damage needs to be reconsidered. So I don't know if the slides are here because it's supposed not to be there. Okay, so maybe I can... Yes, okay. So that's that the, 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 the title. So from your, the, the beginning of the, um, what you said, so it's, it's a little bit more focused than, than uh, uh, what was announced. So it's more, really more on economic damage of climate change. Uh, and so I believe so climate damage uh, needs to be reconsidered. So and the, the title of the talk, Reconsidering Economic Damage of Climate Change. <clears throat> and so this talk will be divided in three parts. Um, so first, I will present how economics uh, approaches uh, climate damage, climate change damage. And second, I will discuss some empirical but mostly methodological problems uh, associated with estimated uh, economic damage of climate change. And my conclusion here will be that estimating climate damage is actually an impossible task. And third, I will question the reasons uh, why climate damage is computed. Uh, and so my conclusion here is, will be that fortunately we do not need uh, to estimate climate, damage, climate change damage. Okay, so <laughs> let us begin with the first part and some definition. <clears throat> uh, so there are two things that is important to distinguish to, to, to understand what I'm saying is uh, the consequences of climate change and the valuation of the consequences of climate change. So the first, the, value, the physical impacts of climate change are the physical consequences, the consequences, okay? So for the consequences, I will talk about impacts. Uh, so to give some examples, stronger and more frequent storm is a physical consequence of climate change. Migration to the pole of species is a biological or ecological consequences, consequence of climate change. And when we have a severe drought, 
uh, which is a physical consequences that turn, it can be turned into an energy consequences. For example, if hydroelectricity uh, is no longer available and which can further have economic consequences if factories have to close or health consequences if hospital cannot function. So on the one hand, we have impacts, that is consequences of climate change. On the other hand, we have something very different, which is valuation of climate change, that is damage. So it's not economic damage, it's damage, okay? Which is valuation of all type of impacts, including economic impacts, but also physical impacts or biodiversity impacts. So the damage of a drought, for example, is the valuation of all the impacts of these droughts, okay? The valuation answers the question, how much? And so we need to estimate or value these impacts. And so the common metrics in which these impacts ought to be evaluated is conventionally in economics a welfare variation. That is a variation in the welfare of people. Okay? So that's very different for the consequences. The consequence is something physical and the damage is a vi uh, welfare variation. That is the impact of the consequences of the impact on welfare. And this is often further transcripted into a measure that is uh, maybe more um, easy to grasp, which is the equivalent consumption losses, which is expressed in percentage GDP, okay? So commonly we speak of damage as X percent of GDP. So by damage, I will mean welfare variation of the impacts, and it is usually negative and the term damage. Um, okay, there are two connotations from this impacts and welfare, which is that impacts are rather um, concrete, they are localized, to certain type of ecosystem, and they are divers with all kinds of different impacts, as we'll see. Uh, on the other hand, on the contrary, damage is rather abstract. Okay, it belongs to the sphere of value. And there is also a tendency to see damage as a comprehensive assessment of all the impacts. So the damage of climate change is something that encompasses all type of impacts. And so it's the total welfare loss of climate change. Okay. So then we already see that computing damage is a demanding task and just knowing type of impact is not sufficient to compute, uh, to compute damage. So economists have uh, computed damage for uh, um, more than three decades actually. Nordhaus, William Nordhaus was one of the first to, to, to do that and 30 years ago he came with uh, some numbers about the, economy, the damage of climate change which were 1% of world GDP for two degrees uh, roughly. 1% of uh, world GDP for two degrees um, uh, warming and um, and um, nine around nine uh, nine degree uh, nine percent for six degrees and uh, recently we have uh, this assessment that has been done by uh, a team in uh, uh, in the U.S. which have tried to uh, compute the estimate of damage uh, in um, in certain scenarios. Uh, coming from very, very detailed uh, econometric data. And we can see that it's roughly what is the, the, uh, the same uh, amount of, um, of damage that uh, Nordhaus has, uh, has found. Uh, but we can see that the numbers are very moderate. Okay? We have at six degrees, so we have only 10% loss of GDP, which is six degrees. It's very, very impressive, six degrees of, of, of warming. Uh, so we can, uh, um, we can see that, uh, for example, it's translated into something very, uh, very particular when we combine that with the economic growth that is, protect that is projected. So here we have world GDPs in 2020 and we have at the end world GDPs in uh, 2100. And so we can see that the, uh, with just the current policy scenario, which is a heating of 3.5 degrees at the end of the century, we have only a meager, a meager um, decrease in world GDP, okay? And even if you have, uh, so that's the, the black, black line, and even if you have a, a damage function that incorporates more, more, more damage than Nordhaus does, uh, did, um, we, have, uh, we have only a, a meager increase in GDP. So this represents climate change as unaltering uh, uh, the growth path of the, of, the, of the world economy. And so this is something that is, uh, that is problematic because if we take a five degrees increase, for example, if we think other kind of evidence, uh, when with a plus five degrees increase, it was only 10 million uh, years ago when the human species would not exist that we experienced such kind of, of, um, of, um, of um, a warming. And uh, we can see that, for example, uh, the world will be completely changed. So we can look not at this type of evidence, but evidence regarding impacts 
which is the uh, novel and disappearing climate, for example, that is the climate that is not experienced today but will appear in the future, or the climate today that will disappear, that we will not have an equivalent in the future, an analog. And for plus five degrees, we have 25%, for example, of emerged land that will experience novel climate. And 40% uh, that will, 40% uh, of two-day climate that will disappear in terms of, of surface. So this gives a very different picture than the, the pictures of, uh, of um, uh, damage here. So I, we can have other kind of evidence. For example, when you look at heat, impact of heat, um, we, we will see that we have different, more and more uh, uh, importance of, of climate change. So we have a very different perspective when we look at, uh, when we consider uh, uh, damage, uh, when we consider damage and when we consider physical impacts. So if you are now convinced that economic damage does not fairly represent the threat of climate change, uh, maybe you think that we could improve this estimate. Maybe with more research, we can overcome the drawbacks of estimates of damage and close the gap between what climate change is and the estimates of its damage. So now I will come to the second part of my talk uh, uh, and uh, the problem with estimating uh, uh, the, um, the damage. So there are three tasks, uh, and each of these tasks has, has problems. So the first one is to encompass all type of impacts. Because what we want is not some kind of measure, some type of impact. We want to have uh, um, uh, the total welfare loss due to climate change. So we have to encompass all type of impacts, and not only to encompass them, that's the first one, but also to value them. But I will come uh, later to this value problem. So we have impact that we know, but that were not quantified. So it's time of unquantified impact. That's some part of the literature discusses some type of impact, but it's not already incorporated into economic, uh, into estimates of uh, uh, economic damage. Uh, but there are also unidentified impacts, impact that we don't know or that we may imagine they, they exist. For example, like social response to physical impacts uh, uh, are really uh, poor known. Poorly known and poorly understood. Uh, it's also the case of uh, conflict induced, uh, uh, climate induced conflicts, for example. How can we, can we deal with this type of impact? Um, so that's a full range of impacts. So here I think that the, the current research can do a lot to have more, uh, to, to, to do more with this type of impact. But I don't think here it's mainly methodological, it can be an empirical problem here. But when it comes to uh, the value of impact, then I think it's, it's another, uh, another perspective. So just to uh, discuss a little bit that, I will, hopefully there is, okay, I will show you here this uh, well-known diagram so that the five reasons for concern of the IPCC, which is something very different uh, than the valuation, because here you have five dimensions of climate change and it's type of physical impact related to different, uh, different dimensions. So you have, for example, this, the first I mentioned is unique and threatened species. I will talk a little bit about that. We have also distribution of impact. Uh, and we have uh, global aggregate impact, actually. You can think that this is only economic damage. So it's, it's only the, 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 the dimension here, is, is, it's, only, it's only here. Although, although this kind of other, other type of, of reason for concern should also be integrated in, these, uh, in the economic damage. And the, the, the last one is the large case singular event, but uh, Tim Linton will, it's a kind of tipping point, but Tim Linton will speak more about that. So if, for example, we, we think of the welfare variation of uh, uh, the loss of a unique and threatened species, uh, well, it's very difficult to do. And we have some kind of uh, uh, non really, it's, we have no really, um, no real methodology to do so. It has been a, a controversy for, um, for, um, more than uh, 25 years to how can we measure the loss of a species. And it's not, uh, it's not something that is related to empirical um, lack of data, for example. It's really something that uh, is related to how do you value a species. So that's uh, uh, part of what uh, um, our previous speaker, uh, Pamela McHill, we said about the multiple value that we have. Multiple value here in the sense that we do not all value uh, in the same way the same species. For a culture, it can be very important. For another one, it can be not really relevant. So how can you, can you value that? It's, it's, it's not something that, that can be done just by you know, asking people what kind of, uh, how many money they want to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to spend to protect the species, so, which is one of the traditional methods uh, economists uh, um, do. 
Uh, and so, so that's, you could say, okay, that's, that's something very not important. Okay, but that's the same with, for example, small island states. Four island states are in the threat of uh, disappearing. Uh, how do you value the disappearing of, of, of a nation? That's, you know, that's something harsh to do, no? Um, if you think about the great coral reef, you know, it's not just one tiny species. It's something very big, very relevant uh, uh, for uh, Australian, but also, I suppose, for, uh, for mankind also. So how do you value that? There is no really answer to, to, to this kind of question. And so these type of, of, uh, of uh, impacts are usually not considered at all or, you know, with some random numbers um, when they are incorporated in, in economic damage. Um, and uh, to give another example, so that was the, the value part, we have also problems about aggregating these impacts. Because these impacts, they are distributed, as this is the third reason for concern. They are, they are uh, distributed in, across several uh, uh, economic agents, populations, and uh, it um, raises very difficult problems to aggregate them. So I will give an example that actually dates to the uh, second assessment report. So here it's even not a, you know, it's, it's not a, a recent story, it's a, it's a long story. That uh, there was a global role about the value of human life in this second assessment report because economics were adding um, welfare losses in terms of dollars. And of course, because uh, casualties, people that are dying because of climate change, are valued as a statistical life, it's proportional, more or less, you know, to the, to the uh, GDP per capita of a country. So which means that uh, people in the, uh, in the uh, developing states uh, were valued much less, I mean, the deaths of these people were valued much less than the deaths in, in the developed country, which was, of course, controversial uh, uh, and which uh, um, what the consequence was this row about uh, global human value. And so in the second assessment report, it was decided not to include this kind of estimates because there was, there was this methodological problem. Uh, some, some philosophers, for example, suggest that we do it the other way around. Instead of using uh, the dollar as the common metric, we use the value of human life as a common, uh, as a common metric, such that you know, one death in a developing country is valued the same as one death in, uh, in a developed country, which Again, can be natural, but there are always some kind of uh, controversy and arguments about this, this, uh, these things. So that was the, the, the difficulty to aggregate impact, but we can also think of the difficulty to aggregate impact on the, on the, um, on the, on the time dimension, which relates to the problem of discounting. <clears throat> so I hope now that I have convinced you that <laughs> climate change, a very little change, uh, climate dispute about climate change uh, damage, a very little chance to be settled. This is not only because of empirical problems, lack of data, or a sufficient skills of researchers. Um, of course, I mean, more data, more funding, uh, larger and, and interdisciplinary team will alleviate some of this problem, but they will not disappear uh, because they are fundamentally lie in epistemological difficulties and in conflicts of value that will not be settled. So now I have a good news for you is that climate damage is not needed for policy making. So we cannot compute them, but they are not needed. And this is my first part. Uh, my third part, sorry. Okay, so um, we would like to know some damage. For example, we would like to know physical impacts. So I'm not saying that we would not, uh, we should not uh, um, um, try to discover what is the impact. We would not like to impact, for example, to, to adapt ourselves. We may also want to know the, some valuation of these impacts related to the uh, loss and damage discussion. Uh, but this is the impact that have occurred, which is something different than projecting uh, what would be the impact at a plus uh, six degrees, uh, uh, you know, in the in the in the far at the end of the of the of the of the century. Um, so when we ask researcher what or uh, why actually is climate uh, damage computed, uh, well, there is not really an answer. Uh, but you can find uh, an answer when you uh, come across uh, some papers about. Uh, um, climate, uh, climate change damage. So uh, uh, I have read some to, 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 uh, to, to discuss this, uh, to prepare here this, this talk. So, uh, and at, the, at some point they all say that, well, climate change damage is really important for policy making. Uh, we need to convey uh, policy decision makers uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, um, of the right, uh, you know, um, um, amount of damage uh, that climate change uh, will be responsible for. Um, and why do they say that? It's um, because actually they say that, well, it would help us 
to design the optimal mitigation path. It would help us to find, you know, within a cost-benefit analysis, the right target, okay, the optimal target, okay, the target that would maximize global welfare. So that's the reason why climate change is computed. Climate change is computed to enter in a cost-benefit analysis at the global uh, level. And that's what, uh, what Nordhaus has done you know, uh, for, uh, for, for more than, uh, than 30, uh, 30 years. Um, well, the good news is that uh, we do not need this target because the international community has already a target. Uh, the plus two degrees was the first internationally discussed at, Co at Copenhagen and incorporated in international law in, in Cancun. And the Paris Agreement of uh, um, 2015 is crystal clear here, I say. Uh, in its article 2.a, uh, it states uh, that uh, it aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by, and I quote here, holding the increase in the global average to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. So the target is in the Paris Agreement. And uh, so it seems that the question the economists uh, uh, um, want to answer has already been answered by the international communities, fortunately without listening to the, to the economists. So we do not need to recompute the optimal mitigation target. And uh, the Paris Agreement gives a clear map of strong sustainability, I suppose. So within the concept of sustainable development and effort to eradicate poverty, which is the caveat within the Paris Agreement, uh, the, the, the thing is, the, the, the recommendation is quite clear. Do as much as you can to reduce carbon emission and curb climate change. Thank you very much, um, Antonin. Uh, so we will uh, directly move on to, uh, to the next speaker, uh, Tim Linton. So Tim Linton, uh, who should be online, um, is the founding director of the Global System Institute and chair in climate change and earth system science at the University of Exeter. His research focuses on the complex web, biology, web of biological, geochemical, and physical processes that shape the, clim the chemical composition of the atmospheres and oceans as well as uh, the Earth climate change. He is a member of the Earth Commission and um, is a Clarivate Web of Science high cite, highly cited researcher. In 2021, he was cited twice in the list of the world most influential climate scientist thing. Uh, Tim, thank you very much for being here and I uh, leave it up to you now. Thanks Antoine. I'm sorry that I couldn't join you in person everybody. I'm still teaching class uh, in Exeter in England uh, today and also looking after my kids in this evening. Um, so I want to talk about climate tipping points, um, but also what I would call um, positive tipping points. Um, so I just was trying to find the um, laser pointer that that may or may not work. So uh, let's not worry about that. Um, so I want to talk about what are essentially um, long, yeah, um, abrupt changes in complex systems, both bad ones in the climate and good ones um, in our societies that we're going to need to avoid the bad climate tipping points. But let me start hopefully with a little movie um, just to get our eye in. Uh, so here's a toy model of a complex system that has alternative stable states. It could be a part of the climate system. It could be part of society. The blue ball rolling around is just representing the state that the system is in at the moment, subject to some fluctuations. But I'm forcing this system in a way that it's losing stability over time, the current state. And at some point, uh, a little nudge is going to be enough to tip the system into a completely different state. And now the balls turn red. Um, that's a kind of toy model describing how the, when we draw a valley like the one the blue ball is in, we say, ah, damping feedbacks are maintaining the status quo of the world as we know it. But sometimes, you know, when the world is a complex system, you get to a point where reinforcing feedbacks that amplify change take over and they rule what we call the dynamics of the system. And that's really what is happening at a tipping point from one state to another. 
So my uh, original research focus was to try and find out and map out what were the parts of the climate as a system that could pass a tipping point into an alternative stable state. Um, and this is a recent update of part of the list we came up with of what we call the tipping elements, the big scale bits of the climate system that could be tipped into another state. And the ones shown here are ones that we describe as global core tipping elements, because if you tip them, the whole climate system knows about it. You have a kind of global repercussion that isn't always an amplification of global warming, but sometimes it is in the case of massive amounts of carbon released from the permafrost. It could be a global irreversible rise in sea level, for example, from lost, losing major ice sheets, or just a fundamental reorganization of the pattern of climate, as we'll see a little later, if we were to tip what's called the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. The time scale over which these different things tip kind of depends on the nature of the system. So ice sheets are very sluggish, but rainforests and some aspects of the circulation of the atmosphere and the, the surface ocean can change very rapidly. There's a second list or map of what are called the regional impact tipping elements. These are things that, okay, we could lose them abruptly. It's not clear whether there'd be a large global or noticeable change in the global climate system, but my word, many people would suffer or would care about the loss of these systems. Antonin mentioned the tropical low latitude coral reefs. 500 million people depend on those for their livelihoods, for example. So what we've done in a recent study is try to assess the best we could from over 230 published papers at what level of global warming um, are these tipping elements at risk of being tipped? And there's, that's always uncertain. And that uncertainty is captured by the kind of yellow to red burning ember scales for each element uh, in the diagram here. Um, and the dotted horizontal black lines are our best estimates of the temperature level at which the tipping point occurs for different systems. The crucial points are that at the current level of warming at about 1.2 degrees C of global warming, um, we, we assess that at least four of these major tipping elements are already at risk, including the big ice sheets on Greenland and West Antarctica, which if they're lost will eventually add over 10 metres to sea level. Also those low latitude coral reefs and also a section of the boreal permafrost that can thaw abruptly. And at 1.5 degrees C of global warming, we uh, fear that those tipping points may be above that level may become likely. Um, of course, things get worse the more you warm the planet though. And so if you like, every 0.1 degrees C of global warming counts in terms of, uh, well, if we can hold the temperature down in terms of limiting the risk of crop crossing damaging tipping points. Now, these, this assessment was done without considering the coupling or the interaction between the tipping elements, but um, it might seem quite intuitive to you that if you tip parts of the climate system, it tends to have re repercussions in other parts of the climate system. And that's what this diagram briefly tries to highlight. I won't talk about all the causal connections, but for example, the Arctic is warming up about two or three times as fast as the global average because a white ice surface has been replaced by a dark ocean surface that absorbs far more sunlight. That Arctic warming is contributing to the Greenland ice sheet accelerating melt. It's also leading to more precipitation, rain and snowfall in the Arctic. Both of those are sources of fresh water, melting ice and snow and rain from the sky that pour into the North Atlantic Ocean. And that fresh water addition disrupts a process called deep convection, which propels the great overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean, which itself is the great connector of the climate system. So as you weaken that, and it has weakened markedly in the last 50 years, 
it moves the band of rainfall in the tropics southwards, disrupting monsoons around the planet, West Africa, India, Amazonia. But it also weakening the overturning leaves heat behind in the Southern Ocean, which threatens the ice sheets around Antarctica. So it's a coupled system, unfortunately, where tipping one thing probably on the whole, on average, makes tipping another more likely. And we've, well, we've begun as a scientific community to look at the impacts of some of these tipping elements, but we've barely begun to do that. Suffice to say, it may be obvious that the impacts are pretty severe. But here's an example looking at this um, scenario of a collapse of the Atlantic overturning circulation. It's known as the AMOC for sure, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Well, this is a collapse that, of that circulation as a tipping point on um, on top of a two and a half degrees C warmer world, which is unfortunately where we're heading under current um, policy commitments. Um, suffice to say, it has some interesting effect, and major effects on the pattern of climate change. Yes, it might cool the North Atlantic region and overwhelm the global warming signal, but as we'll see, that would not be a good thing. Uh, whilst the southern hemisphere would get even warmer. But over on the right hand side, perhaps the most profound changes are the changes to the water cycle globally. So you, you're looking at really large percentage changes in precipitation across parts of the world where many people live and much agriculture goes on. So it gets drier pretty uniformly and quite a lot across Europe. Um, much drier in parts of West Africa and crucially in, uh, across the Indian subcontinent. So this, uh, and we then thought, right, we should have a look at what the consequences of that would be, not just for straight water availability, but for food, for growing of major crops. And uh, unsurprisingly, that those huge changes in climate, including profound climate drying, would have a really detrimental effect on um, the suitability for growing major staple crops like wheat, maize, and to a lesser degree, rice. Um, if we were just focusing on wheat, the one with the biggest effect, we can separate out the contributions of the two and a half degrees C of global warming and then the climate tipping point on top of that. The combined effects are pretty striking. The purple colour means major decline in suitability for growing wheat, um, up to 100% in some regions, including some regions where it's grown uh, now. Now, all in all, it's like a double whammy. The climate change and the tipping point have additive, if not multiplicative, effects on reducing um, the viable area for growing wheat. So it's um, more than halved in uh, that viable area. For maize, it's uh, also a story of additive effects and that area for maize growing is uh, more than halved. For rice, it's a much less clear picture, but at the moment, um, that's not a globally um, dominant stable crop rice. So some major adaptation challenges here, and frankly, some existential risk with this sort of a impact on food production. Now, Antonina has just introduced this uh, toy model that uh, Nordhaus uh, used, or he's mentioned Nordhaus, who built a toy model cost benefit analysis model of the climate problem. This is not, in my view, a sensible approach to the climate problem, but I, several years ago, we thought it would be instructive to see how the recommendations or results of that model are altered if you consider the kind of climate tipping points I've just been introducing. So we took Nordhaus's model called DICE and we simply added to it an extra tipping point module. But we also introduced the fact that tipping points of carry an uncertainty, as does a whole of the climate problem. And there's a stochastic, um, we would call it uncertainty around exactly when a tipping point will be crossed. And we need to, uh, as decision makers, be kind of dealing 
properly with uncertainty in a world where we can never know, perfectly know the consequences of our actions. So we rewrote the model code, code from its original deterministic form, which assumes we know everything perfectly, which is ludicrous, into a um, stochastic dynamic form. And then we added the tipping points in, which means we had to specify some things, but things we had some scientific information on. So essentially, we could specify what's called a hazard rate, a kind of dice rolling likelihood that you're going to pass a tipping point for each of five big bits of the climate system. And as the temperature goes up, the dice gets loaded to become more and more likely to roll a tipping point. We also recognize that tipping points trigger changes that don't happen immediately. And the time scale over which change unfolds depends on the system. So that's the transition time here. And then well, frankly, nobody knows what the final damages would be for world GDP of any of these events. But interestingly, Nordhaus himself thinks the collapse of the Atlantic overturning circulation would have a 25% negative impact on world GDP. So we were more conservative than that and assigned it, in that case, a range between 10 and 20%. And we put all of these five possible tipping points into the model world. And uh, without going over all the details, the crucial point is it completely qualitatively transforms the results of the analysis. So in this original model, Nordhaus and others have been telling the rest of the world that the optimal thing to do is let warming increase to something like three degrees C. And that's the, the green line is the original model. The black line with this gray shaded uncertainty area around it is um, the, the results of the model with the tipping points included. So the original model says do a little bit to tackle climate change, but not very much. And in fact, it looks a whole lot like where current policy commitments are taking us, the green line. Include the risk of climate tipping points. And suddenly the imagined, they're called social planner in the model, decides that we must shut down more than half of fossil fuel burning immediately and get rid of it completely by 2050. That's the black uh, line in the top right um, plot. And in this model world, if that were to happen, then um, global warming is, with reasonable probability, held under one and a half degrees C. Unfortunately, uh, there's plenty, plenty of flaws with this model. Uh, and one of them is probably that it may be how it represents how easy or difficult it is to do that. But uh, the point really is that it shows tipping points make a mockery of the cost benefit analysis approach because it shows that we're not dealing with marginal externalities. We're dealing with existential risks, which in this case, we should be doing everything to avoid. Which brings me to my final theme, which is, well, if we're going to get anywhere near one and a half degrees C of global warming, we need to take the same kind of thinking and apply it to the social realm. And we need to be thinking about, can we find and trigger some positive tipping points to accelerate change from the business as usual state of fossil fuel economy and nature destruction to decarbonized economy? And I just wanted to finish by showing that there are clear examples, not only that that these tipping points, these positive tipping points exist, but they're already starting to happen. So it may be only one nation, but uh, uh, Norway has tipped profoundly in personal mobility away from petrol and diesel vehicles and cars in particular here to electric cars. Um, this is old data. As of today, um, electric cars are about 85% of market sales in Norway. Um, and when we looked at the data back in 2019, it became very clear that uh, the tipping, that it really is a tipping point to electric vehicles, because basically at that time, they were the same price to buy as petrol or diesel vehicles in Norway, and the, and the consumer voted with their wallet uh, to buy EVs. Whereas in every other country, even if they were quite close to price parity, they had a very, very meager market share. Things look different now at the end of 2022. We have, for example, 40% market share of electric vehicles in the UK. So the tipping point is spreading. It's spreading across Europe and it's spreading across the world. And I'm not saying 
it's a perfect technology, by the way, in electric vehicles, but I am telling you that 15% of greenhouse gas emissions come from cars across the planet and switching to EVs will radically reduce that chunk of emissions. And it's not just important because of uh, transport considerations. Underneath that tipping point is the fact that batteries have got spectacularly cheaper over the last decade by more than a, by a factor of 10 at least. And they are continuing to get cheaper the more electric vehicles and the more batteries we make. And that opens up opportunities for tipping points to spread to other sectors of the economy. So there are some obvious ones, like it, well, the more, more batteries and electric vehicles you make, and uh, the cheaper the next battery gets to make, that'll enable electrifying uh, lighter goods transport. It might tip oil firms to stop becoming oil firms because they realize they're sat on a lot of stranded asset. But most importantly, very cheap battery storage is a key enabler for an even bigger tipping point to renewable energy. And that's simply because when you want to boil the kettle to make a cup of tea is not always when the sun is shining or the wind's blowing. So you need effective and cheap storage in the electricity grid that's dominated by renewables. And uh, the tipping point to renewable energy is also uh, starting to happen and unfold, unfold around the world. Um, this is this is the historical case from the UK that we've tipped away from coal burning for power ge generation just in the last 10 years. Coal burning was 40% of power generation in the UK in 2012. It's pretty much zero today. And it's renewable energy that's picked up most of the slack. In this case, the tipping point was a modest, was triggered by a modest price of carbon levied on just the power sector, um, in addition to what the EU trading price of carbon at the time. But as what happened then was uh, instead of having used up all the, all the renewable energy on the grid, instead of switching on a coal-fired power station next, um, because that's the dirtiest form of power production and got more of the tax, as it were, it became sensible to switch on a gas power station next instead. But that meant that all the people who were invested in burning coal were make, weren't making any money. And in fact, they started making a loss. And so surprise, surprise, they very quickly pulled investment out of coal burning in the UK, as summarised by this utility analyst in 2016. And pretty soon after the utility companies that, the, that run the power stations started destroying the coal burning power stations, which at which point we were at an irreversible tipping point where we'll never, we'll never go back in the UK to burning coal and good riddance to it. But we want to think about the global picture here and the crucial thing for the global picture is that um, renewable energy is now the cheapest form of power across most of the world in what's called a new for new comparison. This year in 2022, for the first time ever, new uh, renewable power globally has exceeded the increasing demand for electricity globally. So it started to displace fossil fuels for power generation. And solar panels uh, have been carrying on, along with wind turbines, down this spectacular curve of declining costs the more solar panels you make. And those uh, incredible economies of scale, as they're called, and incredible reinforced feedback is destined to continue over the coming years, making renewables cheaper than fossil fuels have ever been and possibly cheaper by, you know, a factor of four or something crazy like that. So this is an enormous opportunity space for, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, where there's only about 20 percent access to electricity at present to go straight for not only um, cheap solar power, but also that will, could enable, for example, least developed nations to become major high producers of hydrogen for export to the rest of the world, thus improving their balance of trade, because instead of it both importing oil and gas and importing, say, mopeds or other vehicles, they will be exporting fuel to the world, even if they're still importing vehicles and other things. So to finish, what we begin to see are the possibility of not just bad cascades of bad climate tipping points, but good cascades of positive tipping points in the economy. 
basically those low cost batteries enable the transition to renewable electric energy electricity but as renewable electricity becomes cheaper than electricity has ever been from fossil fuels and ever cheaper still it incentivizes for incentivizes electrifying transport uh, not just cars but then trucks and everything else and then it will incentivize switching on the production of green or clean hydrogen and we could get a cascade going of kind of um, transforming the whole power energy um, economy if you like to uh, zero emissions and by our current models and projections even without further climate policy, this kind of fundamental transition to renewables dominant will have happened by 2050. So to summarise, um, I told you some bad news, uh, exceeding one and a half degrees zero global warming is putting us at risk of multiple climate tipping points and every 0.1 degrees zero warming counts. The most studied tipping point is one that would pose existential risks to food production and water supplies. So these are obviously not marginal externalities. They should completely alter our approach to uh, tackling climate change. And if we're going to get anywhere near the Paris target of limiting warming to well below two degrees C, we're going to need uh, some of these positive tipping points I've been talking about, but they exist and, and they're starting to happen. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Um, last but not least, I will uh, now um, welcome our last speaker, uh, Lauriane Mouisset. is a CNRS researcher fellow in ecological economics. Her interdisciplinary work is at the interface of ecology, environmental economics, bioeconomic modeling, and epistemology. Um, they co she contributes the reflection on public policies to achieve and maintain sustainable socio-ecosystems, particularly terrestrial. She has published a book on ecological challenge and numerous articles in international journals, and she is the co-director of the collection Science Durable, Science Durable, sorry, <laughs> at Edition de la Rue d'Ulm. Um, Lauriane, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. So um, I'm the third uh, speaker and I would like to change a bit the perspective compared to the previous talk. So I think the third talk were, were very interesting to um, provi provide information about the challenges we have when we deal with uh, strong sustainability and uh, what are the objectives also. But I believe that um, now the, the core of the challenge is actually to um, investigate the question of how we can design public policies or uh, management in general, how we can de design public policies to, to deal with these challenges and how it's possible to manage in a sustainable way socio-ecological systems. So... Um, I would like to speak to you about bioeconomic models. I don't know if you know this kind of methodology, but I'm very convinced that uh, this kind of model uh, could help to, um, to design concrete public policy or management um, to, 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 uh, to have a social, a sustainable socio-ecological systems. So, so to do so, I will uh, provide you some uh, overview uh, information and then an illustration based on the Birdland model. So the objective is not to speak more specifically about, about this Birdland model, but I will uh, use this model as an illustration because I think it's easier to speak about methodology based on an, an, a concrete illustration. So first, I will uh, start with the overview about bioeconomic models. And uh, mm -hmm. right. um, okay. so the objective um, is, um, so we, we, we thought about that, but we, the objective is to implement a sustainable development, which is one of the main challenges of the 21st century. And to do so, we have uh, three uh, fold objectives. First, um, we need to understand the co-evolution between society and ecosystems within um, socio-ecological systems. And to do so, we need an adequate representation of the relationships between society and ecosystems. And um, to do so, we, we need to develop an inter interdisciplinary scientific research. So in the, lit in, in the scientific literature, there is two types of modeling framework which try to deal with these objectives. First of all, some models are dedicated to the management of exhaustible resources, so basically gas extraction or, 
oil extraction. So it's um, stocks, stock models which are based on the extraction rates without any consideration for the regeneration rates. Um, and then on the other side, we have models dedicated to um, the management of renewable resources. So it's basically flow models. And when we uh, consider uh, biodiversity and ecosystem, of course, we are um, focused on this kind of uh, model. So uh, more specifically, regarding the flow models, the fishery cases are really interesting uh, because it's, it was the first big uh, bioeconomic model in the scientific literature, especially uh, regarding the management of uh, earring population in the North Sea. So this uh, fishery-based uh, bioeconomic model uh, provided very important uh, concepts in the bioeconomic literature, especially the maximum sustainable yield and the maximum economic yield which are both uh, two concepts which um, uh, try to explain what are the optimal rates of uh, fisheries to um, maximize the profits and uh, maintain the fish population in a long-term perspective. But what about, what about it, is it working or no? Yeah. But what about the terrestrial socio-ecological systems? So it's more, uh, yeah. So to do so, we, we, prov we provide um, a literature review and we um, read a lot of paper and then we selected some paper according to the definition of the model, of the definition of the bio biological dynamics, the definition of the economic process which is involved in the bioeconomic model and then about the linkage between ecological models. I will go fast, but if you um, want more detail, of course, I would be happy to... More comes up? Okay. Um, I will be happy to, to provide more, more details. So at the end, we have 300, uh, more than 300 articles. And we assess all these articles, all these bioeconomic uh, models, according to different kind of um, criteria. Uh, on the one hand, uh, methodological criteria regarding uh, regarding the specifications of the models, and also um, criteria regarding the narratives, which is behind the uh, equations. So here it's an, an overview, <laughs> um, and uh, each uh, dot represents a bioeconomic model. And what is interesting here is that um, there is no... Uh, uh, so on the uh, left side, on uh, so in um, black and yellow, you have two types of models, which um, are models dedicated to questions regarding harvesting. So it's basically a bioeconomic model applied to terrestrial biodiversity, but which are really close to the model which are used for fisheries. And uh, so the, que the main question is, uh, how much can we harvest biodiversity to uh, maximize profits while maintaining the long-term uh, biodiversity population. So basically it's applied to elephant population, for example. And uh, it's very class, it's the fr economic framework is very classical to the neoclassical economic framework with a strong use of cost benefit, benefit analysis and uh, biodiversity is usually monetized within bioeconomic model. On the other side, so it's on the uh, right side in green and purple, you have a lot of, we have models, which uh, are uh, mainly based on the question on conservation uh, objective. So in this uh, bioeconomic model, the objective is not to deal or to trade between economic performance and ecological performance. The objective is to uh, consider um, a priori biodiversity or conservation uh, targets and uh, to investigate the question on uh, how, uh, how we can do to achieve uh, this uh, conservation target um, according to economic uh, constraint, of course. In this case, uh, it's, um, the, it's a bit different compared, I mean, it's a bit different, yeah, the, compared to the neoclassical um, framework. It's more open, I would say, and the main um, approach is, is a, a cost effective analysis. And in, in general, biodiversity is not monetized because it's bioeconomic model uh, which link ecological um, side of the model and economic side of the model, which, which are linked through biophysical uh, variables. So I will speak about this second type of model, so the conservation one, because I believe that it's uh, the more uh, the model the methodology which is more connect connected to the objective of strong sustainability. 
so to do so, as I told you in introduction, I would like to use the Birdland bioeconomic <laughs> model. So uh, first of all, just few information about this model. So this model, um, so you have the reference of the seminal article, um, and then we have more than uh, 15 um, published articles in peer review international um, journal, and uh, some of them are in development. Um, so the model, it's an applied model, which is applied to a metropol metropolitan France. It's applied to avian biodiversity, and more specifically, we have 60 uh, birds uh, in France, in natural and semi-natural habitats. So the overall question is how to manage France terrestrial socio-ecological systems to make them sustainable, namely how uh, it's possible to provide socio-economic outcomes while maintaining ecological requirements uh, within a socio-ecological system uh, in France. Um, so, ah oui, il n'y a pas d'animation en fait. Uh, so, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I had a, a very nice, uh, well, <laughs> okay, so, um, so I, I will not provide you any equations, of, of course, because it's not a uh, place, but I would like to give you the, maybe the intuitions of this kind of bioeconomic model, thanks to this um, modeling architecture. So uh, we have um, national decision maker at national scale, which, dis which decide public policy scenarios according to different political constraints. And this, this public policy scenario is received by dif different land planners. So it's regional pl uh, land planners in France. And uh, these um, land planners, they have a classical microeconomic uh, model. They try to maximize their utility function or yeah, their profit, it depends. And according to this maximization, pro uh, maximization program, they um, um, decide which uh, will be the next land uses and uh, agronomic specifications over time. Uh, of course, this depends on economic market incentives and uh, climate information. This land use and agronomic specification will impact the quality of the habitat in the region. And this uh, uh, habitat quality will impact the biodiversity population, metapopulation, of course. I mean, we can change the model, uh, but it's basically an ecological uh, model. Of course, it's, we can integrate ecological uncertainty uh, within this ecological um, model. Then we, um, we can have a feedback effect from the uh, biodiversity uh, system towards the uh, land use and agronomic specification. And of course, we have a feedback effect from ecological side on the economic one. Then uh, we assess the performances of this model. And we can use a, a large set of indicators. It's economic, ecological, productive, um, social, and so on uh, indicators. These indicators can be used as a, feed, as a feedback within the public policy scenarios by the decision maker, a uh, function of um, he, uh, his objectives. And then we have uh, the impact of uh, climate change on the three uh, level of the bioeconomic model. So as you can see, because we have uh, already the overall architecture, is that we have uh, three um, models, the national public policy model, then we have the microeconomic model and the, um, ecology, the regional ecological model. And what is interesting here, it's actually we have the land use uh, and agronomic specification, and so the habitat quality, which is in between the ecological side and the economic side of the bioeconomic model. This means that we are, we um, we, I mean, we, <laughs> me, with this uh, specific model, but in, in more uh, general in the, uh, this kind of uh, bioeconomic model, the, the, the coupling between the ecological and the economic side of the model is uh, made by biophysical uh, variable and not by monetary variable. So this is a very important point for with uh, many implications, and I will come back on that. But it's also uh, very important to understand the difference between this kind of model and the classical neo uh, and the classical bioeconomic model, which are very close to neoclassical um, economic framework. So uh, I would like to, uh, um, to first of all, to, 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 to give you some elements of discussion, methodological um, elements of discussion. And I will uh, do that uh, now. And then I will give you some example of uh, what kind of results we can obtain with this type of model. Ah, mais ça marche, en fait. bon. 
<laughs> so just a few elements of, uh, of discussion regarding the methodological issue. First, about data and calibration. So, um, and then we will start with the difficulties <laughs> because we have to be uh, fair <laughs> and we have difficulties with some uh, bioeconomic model. And um, one of the main difficulty is regarding the data we need to use to calibrate or estimate the parameters within this uh, model. We need a lot of data regarding the lot of different systems, economic one, productive one, ecological ones. Of course, the data are not uh, all the time available. They are not um, developed at a similar temporal or geographical um, perspective. So it's yeah, it's there is a lot of work about uh, combining, finding, and combining all of the data within a big database, which has a, a consistency actually. And also, we need a lot of knowledge because. So I, I haven't developed, but um, it's. Um, it's uh, in general, bioeconomic models are based on uh, equations which um, uh, model process, concrete pro process, ecological process or economic process, and we need to have information <laughs> about these processes. So, and we need information, uh, I mean, we, we need uh, uh, knowledge from the ecologi ecological sciences and economic sciences, and sometimes, uh, yeah, there is some mismatch, and so, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit so it's a bit different. It's a bit um, complicated. So I would say that this is the main issue of this um, bioeconomic model. But there is some um, advantages of having this uh, bioeconomic model. The first one is about the fact that because we are uh, doing the coupling uh, through biophysical process instead of um, value coupling, uh, we avoid a lot of critics which uh, emerge from the debates on biodiversity monetization. Then, uh, because we um, model the biodiversity state, then it's possible to, um, to assess the ecological performance uh, thanks to a set, a large set of ecological indicators, and then we avoid the problem of the synthetic uh, indicator focus, which is, uh, which is strongly criticized by ecological um, scientists. The last part is about a scenario and perspective. So because we use mechanistic models instead of stati statistic model, it's better to um, investigate future trends outside the calibration sets. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a bit technical. I don't know. But yeah, it's easier because we, 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 exp we are more explicit about the mechanism. And then it's possible to, uh, to specify some tipping points, basically. At the end, uh, I would like to say that um, because we have this biodiversity state, it's possible to uh, investigate different value of biodiversity instead, instead of the unique uh, monetary value. Um, of course, we can discuss a lot about the methodical issues of bioeconomic model, but I would like to provide you some, um, some just some elements of results and discussion. It will be super fast, but just to, to provide you some illustration. So as I told you, the overall questions is about how to manage French terrestrial social ecological system to make them sustainable. And we can have different uses of this kind of bioeconomic model in the literature. So very classical use, which investigate uh, macro uh, and micro variables, such as public policies or risk aversion coefficient, all this kind of stuff. Uh, there is also the uh, classical question about the interference between uh, eco ecological crisis and uh, other global issues, especially climate change. And then uh, we have two uh, things that I would like to uh, present here. The first one is um, that it's possible to investigate alternative economic manage management, such as ecological planifications, which is, I think, uh, very connected to the question of strong sustainability. And then we can also investigate all the alternative thoughts about sustainability understanding. So here, basically, uh, it's in, in this uh, article, we investigate the question of, sp of spatial planification and how it can improve bioeconomic sustainability of lands. So I will not provide all the detail, but basically we have um, France and sorry, <laughs> we have France and uh, we design ecological networks uh, based on corridor and um, uh, biodiversity reserves, and then we compare uh, public policy 
so basically sustain, um, subsidies dedicated to uh, grasslands, if the uh, subsidies is uh, given for all the world territory or if the subsidy is given just on the ecological networks and we, investi and we investigate the question of cost effectiveness and we show that there is some um, ecological spillovers, meaning that, of course, the performance is better within the ecological networks, but we have also um, spillover effects, neighbor neighboring effects on the region which are close to the ecological networks. And I think that this, this kind of concrete, because it's a concrete uh, public policy which is close to what is already done by France, French ministry, I think it's. Uh, I believe that uh, it's a, a good um, a good way to concretely investigate the question of strong sustainability. And then the second uh, uh, thing I would like to explain here is about: uh, Is it possible to go further the question of economic optimality? Because I'm really convinced that the problem of economic uh, classical framework is the optimality, actually. And this question of optimality is not uh, consistent with uh, strong sustainability objectives. And, but when you, do, yeah, when you say that, and that uh, what we can do, actually, <laughs> we have to, to propose something. And I think that viability, is, um, which is a mathematical framework which has been developed by French mathematicians, it's a good um, tool, which is a good perspective for sustainability. So in the viability, viability objective, uh, sorry, uh, framework, there is no uh, optimal criteria. All the criteria are considered as constraints. So here, for example, the budgetary constraints, the income constraints, the biodiversity constraints. So there is no uh, optimization of uh, something. There is no optimization of income or there is no optimization of biodiversity. All the, um, the level are considered in the same uh, perspective as constraints. And then we can design very nice viability <laughs> kernel. So here it's, um, so the color, the probability of satisf satisfying uh, all the constraints all together at all time. And uh, you have the X and the Y axis, which are uh, two types of sustainability. But what is interesting here is that in um, red, this means that you are not viable. This means that at least one constraint is not satisfied. But in blue, this means that on the, on, the, on, the, on the side, you are sure to satisfy all the constraints all the time. And of course, uh, there is no um, ranking between the public policies. We are within this viability kernel. But on the contrary, I think it's uh, interesting because it keeps open the discussion because it's possible to add other criteria regarding, for example, social criteria or productive criteria, which are not included in this example. But it's also, also possible to integrate other um, discussion, discussion about other values, as uh, Antonin mentioned in, the, in, his, in his talk. Uh, yeah, uh, don't have, I don't have any time, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lorian. Um, it's been extremely interesting. Thank you uh, to all of the presenters. Um, uh, uh, it was, it was, I think, very complimentary and, and uh, very enlightening as well. Uh, so we now have uh, a bit of time, uh, 20 minutes for questions. Um, uh, I will launch them. Uh, I will provide a few of them, uh, and then you can answer um, uh, all of all or a section, uh, a selection of them. And in the meantime, uh, if the room wants to have some questions, uh, please raise your hand, and we will distribute uh, a mic uh, uh, in here. So um, let me just—I I, I have the privilege of uh, hosting this session, so I can I can use my privilege directly. Um, so so I guess I have, and and these are also based on the questions that we have had online. Um, I guess there's two two questions that I want to ask, um, and they are somewhat uh, controversial. Um, the first one is um, we we have seen that um, uh, in other works that that there is a strong correlation between social and economic tensions and biodiversity degradation or climate change, while well, climate emissions and so on, um, GHG uh, emissions, um, which seems to say that. Um, well, which begs the question, should we first address social tensions or economic tensions before trying to protect the environment? And it goes back to the question of, of Nordos, which was saying, well, uh, we have more pressing issues than, than climate. Uh, we should first address uh, uh, poverty or inequality alleviation and then, uh, uh, because climate is not so important. So I know it's a controversial question, but, but I want to launch the debate. Um, 
uh, and, and, and as a follow-up, for, especially for Lorian, uh, is there any ways in which, well, I guess, I guess it's for everyone, is there any ways in which you can start integrating social aspects into your work? The sec second question, I think, is more general, is about how do we define welfare? I mean, fundamentally, uh, all of the questions uh, that you, were, you were addressing were showing, well, we're going to have biophysical impacts, but then the question is, how do we translate this into economic or welfare issues, and, and so should we change the way, the way we measure welfare, GDP, and so on, or uh, should we have uh, other, other ways of incorporating them? Um, I don't know who wants to start. Should we go in uh, the order of presentation, or reverse order, or just have emergence? <laughs> Montana? So I can start. I see that Tim is one also um, to add something. Um, yes. So regarding your your, your last question first <coughs> about um, uh, welfare and, and GDP, I think GDP is very different from welfare. Um, GDP is just a measure of economic activity, and that's the reason why it has been designed. And I think we can keep that, you know, just to measure economic activity. But welfare is something very different. And uh, as I said, I mean, there, there are no really um, ways to measure this welfare. I mean, you have different approach to, to welfare, and it's even not clear whether just focusing on welfare is something very relevant. I mean, when you look at uh, uh, something, um, theories from uh, um, justice, from philosophers, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's welfare is, it may be or may not be, you know, the main, the main variables. So uh, I would say that um, why do we care about welfare? Uh, uh, and uh, um, to me, if we go into this deliberative uh, um, uh, decision making, if we go into uh, incorporate multiple value, then we'd not need welfare because there are different perspective from different people about welfare, what welfare is. And so I think also with uh, Lorian that the viability approach is much more powerful because then you agree on a set of um, let's say, ecological and social conditions that enable any people to pursue their own welfare goals. Uh, and that's what we want. We, we do not want, actually, to, to tell uh, um, other people what they want to do. You know, that's a that's, that's basic principle. And the problem with welfare is that it tried to capture that, but it's, it, it tried to, 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 um, it, to function. It, you need to have a measure of welfare that is common to, to, to all people. And so, so I, I, I think there is a contradiction here, and so I would rather uh, focus on the ecological and social condition that we want to achieve rather than discuss welfare. Tim, Lorian, do you want to either questions? Tim. I'd have a go on the first one. I think it's a false dichotomy now to even ask the question whether we should be tackling the social and economic things first and the environmental things second, as if they were um, separate or when in fact they're obviously now completely entangled. So we can debate endlessly um, what well, you know, proportion of conflicts, uh, increasing hate speech, et cetera, are correlated with uh, climate change, but it's clear that there are or growing, uh, sadly growing correlations there. Uh, but also it's to me obvious that, that doing the things that improve energy security and are good for, yes, well-being and welfare in the medium, short and long run, are the same things that are going to be tackling the climate crisis and hopefully the nature loss crisis as well. In other words, the sooner we transition to renewable energy, the better our collective uh, welfare will all, will be and the more money we'll save by the latest analysis. Um, so it's time to leave the fossil fuels behind. And of course, there are some less well-off people whose jobs, um, et cetera, may be uh, felt at risk in that accelerating transition. And then it is the job of good governance to provide social safety nets where needed for those people. And of course, you're sat um, with the famous Gilets Jaunes protests in a place where mistakes were made um, over how to govern a, a transition. But uh, we, we learn by doing, and I think it's, it's eminently possible to govern well and deal with those um, social safety nets where needed. Because in the aggregate picture, 
it's definitely net welfare benefit to be tackling climate change and nature loss as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, so maybe a few few elements of, uh, of Renzo. Um, I think that the problem in your question is not about uh, how we define welfare, but the fact that welfare should be uh, the first one compared to ecological uh, environmental objective, or on the, on the side that it should be the second one. So the problem, I think, is that there is a ranking. A ranking and I believe that it's possible to go further this uh, ranking question if we adopt a viability approach. And by considering the two type of objective at the same level, and then it's possible, as I, as I explained, it's possible to refine uh, welfare later, because it's possible, and or it's possible to include other type of welfare or other definitions of welfare. And so the problem is not the welfare, but the ranking, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and sorry for the wrong questions. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go in the room. I've seen some questions here, Eric. Uh, thank you. Um, I, ju I just wanted to follow up on uh, on the discussion that just happened, and I, I, I would like to draw a distinction and maybe then have you comment on it. Um, uh, as as a non neoclassical economist myself, uh, you know, there's discussions about what do you call yourself, you know, uh, and I like to call myself an economist. Um, and so what's the economic approach? Um, and I would, I would just like to uh, propose that the real distinction here is whether you, uh, the, the, the status that you give to the welfare theorems, which when you look at them are quite artificial and really don't apply much to human life, which uh, we, we knew, uh, which was true even before you get to ecosystems, and then turn to what is an appropriate analysis. And there, there are a lot of economic questions where analytical techniques are available. The bioeconomic models, the question about employment, and all of this. So I, I guess I would just ask, um, what, what is an appropriate ec uh, role for economics? Um, uh, in in these kinds of problems. Thank you. Hello. Um, ah, it doesn't work. Yes. Uh, Bruno Boada from the University of Lille. Uh, I have I have a question for each uh, presentation, but I, I will only uh, ask a question to uh, Antonin, for example, because I, I found your presentation very interesting and the other presentations very interesting too. Thank you. Um, my question is. Um, uh, are you talking about uh, what kind of economist are you talking about precisely? It, I think it's the extension of the previous question. Because um, are you talking about uh, mainstream economists? Are you talking about macroeconomists? For example, I am uh, in the box of socio economists. I am. People say I am a socio economist. So I think, of course, socio economics is very important because it's a field economist. Um, there are a lot of empirical works and so on. So I agree with you, of course. But I would like if I would like to know if your presentation tried to show that in fact macroeconomists are useless. I don't think so, of course. I'm a little bit pro provocative. I would like to work with macroeconomists as a social economist and field economist. But so what is behind your presentation in terms of paradigm? To be simple, thank you. Maybe just one last question, and then we'll uh, we'll have a round of answer. Go ahead. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's very quite related to uh, to the previous question. Uh, uh, yes, I'm Hugo Chonet from ESX School of Management and University College London. Um, it, it's also a question for for Antonin, but I would uh, I would love to hear also from from others what they think about that. Uh, w when we hear you, I think it's it sounds very intuitive and logic for many of us. So, what is the reaction from people that traditionally don't? agree with your point of view how do if uh, uh, Nordhaus is in the room I'm not sure but what would he uh, say basically just very simply what, what are their counter arguments I would say thank you um, and, and maybe what we can say is that uh, Tim and Lorian, if, if you have your own thinking about uh, what economists should do or should not do it's it's also more than welcome uh, let's go to the reverse order so maybe Lorian, you want to start or 
Antonin first, okay. <laughs> I think it was uh, most of the question. Uh, so uh, to answer first uh, your, your question about economics, I think I've tried to figure it at the, uh, so it's the re reconsidering economic damage, reconsidering the damage of climate change. So I was talking about this type of economy that we're considering, you know, um, uh, climate damage and the, the climate change damage. And so the, the, the underlying assumption is quite clear. It's, you know, it's neoclassical economists uh, I'm trying to make some kind of uh, optimization at the global or regional scale. Uh, um, so uh, I was not implying that, you know, economics in all fields is not useful. I was just saying that trying and to 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 um to dig deeper into this type of question is 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 in my opinion not the thing that we should do to address the 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 the, the climate change challenge i mean it's 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 there is little uh added value in you know knowing the economic damage but not <laughs> knowing the physical impacts so i was quite clear on that i mean we should uh, go of course uh, have more work on the physical biophysical impact but try to valuing those is uh, for me something that come from a paradigm that is this paradigm of cost benefit analysis so that will answer also the, the the first question which is what is uh, uh, what is the role of economics i think that the problem with cost benefit analysis is that it's put the economist in the position of being the decision maker because you have your objective function and then you optimize it and then you say, okay, that's the solution. That's the solution you should follow. Uh, and uh, I don't think that, uh, uh, that the role for economics to provide a, a solution, they can provide data, they can provide insights uh, uh, through some kind of processes. Uh, and then I uh, very much fond of social economics and all the type of, 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 economics, of economics, but uh, uh, this is very different. So the role of economic is not to, to, um, to, um, is not to decide uh, um, um, in place of the decision maker, it's actually to, uh, uh, to give some information into a decision making process. So that's how I think for it's it's, it's uh, completely different. So to answer the third question. <laughs> um, so it's it's um we have some kind of <laughs> argument with colleagues about that. Um, um there are some people, mostly economics, who are very fond of this rationality things. And they say that, okay, but this target, that international target is not, you know, it's not rational, it's not fact-based, so we, we should discuss that to have better targets. So that's because they believe in this optimal, in this optimal framework and so they believe that they can have this optimal solution. Um, so that's one kind of answer. The other answer is that, well, you know, we know it's, it's let's say, not very good science, but you know it can be useful if you have some uh, um, some numbers and that say that well the optimal target is not five degrees, it's two degrees. Okay, but I'm not sure that this this type of of argument you know is really convincing because who are you trying to convince? Are you trying to convince real decision makers? Or are you trying to convince your colleagues in the economics field? That's that's you know something that is quite of a um, a circular here analysis. So you find it's important to have this kind of assessment because you speak to people that are attuned to this kind of reasoning, to this optimal reasoning. So, so I would not really. Uh, but that's for me. That's the main two argument. That's okay. So we are doing some very absurd thing in fighting climate change because there are some more uh, needs and that which we showed with this cost-benefit analysis that climate change is not very important. That's one answer. And the other side is, okay, we know it's, you know, it's just some kind of arguments and some um, uh, 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 just, you know, a way to, to, to put your argument into the public debate. But then I think it's not convincing either. Thank you, Antonin. Uh, Tim, do you want to jump in? Sure. I mean, I think it's... Uh, delicate territory when you ask non-economists to uh, assign the appropriate role for economics, economics. but as you ask, um, I'd say that part of the role of economics or an appropriate role is to try to advise policymakers using the right tools about how they make decisions about the investment of public money. But frankly, there's a a pathology at the moment where an enormous amount of inappropriate advice is being given because completely the wrong tools are being used for, for quite a lot of uh, policy questions. And that does speak back to the fact that 
you know, optimizing cost benefit analysis tools are being sometimes used in completely for completely the wrong classes of questions. They're very appropriate for some classes of questions and inappropriate for others. At a bigger level, though, um, it, it would appear to me that some economists uh, were advising in my lifetime, early in my lifetime, you know, quite effectively advising policymakers to deregulate markets to an extreme in the so-called neoliberal agenda. I think that was a, an ideological move and, a certain, and went well beyond uh, what was appropriate for economists to be doing. And I personally feel we're all suffering the consequences of that. So I suppose I'd describe that as an inappropriate role for economics in the political economy and ideology. Thank you. Um, Tim, Lorian, do you want to add something? Uh, I think it was in the same spirit. I totally agree with the other um, uh, person. So I think the confusion comes from the fact that uh, the economics uh, uh, exercise is to um, optimize something and then to find a single solution because because they find in their exercise a, sh a single solution there is then a confusion between um, the scientific advice and the concrete public policy decision so i think it's very close to what uh, has been said before thank you um do we have any other questions in the room yes uh, go ahead thank you um so rachel colby i'm working in sustainability and agriculture um, and so I'm following this debate because I've been very frustrated with the way things in the models are framed because what we're needing is a system approach and no longer actually breaking out the different variables. And the first question, what do we do first? Welfare, uh, environment? No, we actually have to consider them all in order to move forward in things that actually can be sustainable. Peren in French, you know, that could actually be lasting. Um, and so I just had some questions about that because it's difficult for us to see the economics of the transition. It's difficult for us to project what is the future model, the economic model that's going to come out of farmers who have transition, transitioned. And do we see all of the um, biodiversity, carbon capture, uh, water cycles, carbon cycles, uh, nitrogen cycles, all of the benefits that could come out from making the transition, and yet, as of today, we don't put value on that. And so that doesn't actually feed in then to sort of the economics of how we can make farming move forward and be a solution. So I was just wondering if, especially with the tipping points um, and the different modeling that we were looking at, how are you seeing this move forward and what do you think would be the the initial game changer that we on the field we can work on to be going in the right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we had another question over there. Yeah. Yep. So I'm Pierre from the UC Louvain in Belgium and a PhD student of Antoine Godin. Uh, yeah, my question is to Tim Lenton. So I was really happy to, to uh, have your talk about climate tipping points because I feel that in general, the, the general public and myself are beginning to be quite uh, knowledgeable about how the global uh, climate mechanisms and what is at stake, but generally people really don't understand the thing about p t tipping points. Or we understand the concept of tipping points, but the general public d doesn't have a clear view of what are the tipping points, what are the risks, etc. And so I wonder: uh, is this uh, this the information is not conveyed to the general public? Is it because there is a, a lack of uh, consensus within the scientific community, or is it because the IPCC reports do not talk uh, enough about it? Uh, so how could the, those be communicated better so that the general public has a better yeah, understanding of those issues? And um, just one last question from the, from the, the, the online participants. Um, how do we integrate the nature of vulnerability uh, into, into uh, climate assessment and, and so on? And is there a dichotomy between uh, vulnerability and impacts and, and the, the feedback loop between vulnerability and then the overall economic or social uh, uh, dynamics? Um, yeah, so Tim first. <laughs> There's okay. a Go ahead. Um, thank you for the question about why why are we not getting the message on tipping points better communicated? There's a long history to the answer, I think. I think fundamentally, we're not educated to think in systems. Some of us are, but we um, people like me seem to be in a um, 
a privileged minority. Um, so I think generally um, we're not brought up to think like this. And I use tipping points actually as quite an effective way into thinking about complex systems and not just being paralyzed by the complexity, but, but as a useful way in. But yeah, clearly the questioner was right. The IPCC has kind of been marginalizing this or way of thinking in the past, but has suddenly come around to it recently. So we may, we may see some progress. There are calls for a, a special report from the IPCC on tipping points. But I think more deeply, it's we need a we need a broader I don't know, collective education effort to think better in systems of tipping points becoming a particular manifestation of uh, feedback thinking. Um, I try my best to communicate this way and to communicate as much and as widely as I can. And I shall be right. I'm started writing a popular trade book, so I'll do my best to make that accessible. But I guess it's all beholden on all of us if we think this is this is a, a, um, an empowering or useful way of thinking to to commit to be part of communicating it would be uh, one answer. And I think it was. Just, just while I've got the floor on the farming agriculture sector question, I wish I had a clear answer there because I sense that this is a sector where many exciting initiatives bubble up but then struggle to scale and everybody asks themselves, why isn't this good thing scaling? I feel like if we can have, for example, um, po political actions that change the valuation system for farmers and other um, land managers, uh, this can really change things fast. And it may be the only positive thing to come out of Brexit that we have exited the cap, the common agricultural policy in a, in a position in, in our little increasingly irrelevant island of Great Britain to be revising the uh, financial incentive scheme for farmers and other land users. And of course, there's a massive political fight going on about that. But there are some moves in a positive direction that very loosely called public money for public goods, but meaning environmental goods and services. And that's not perfect, but we might see a real change uh, in, uh, that will that is already starting to inspire much more nature renewal, I think, than we saw in the past. I have my fingers firmly crossed on that because of the delicate politics of my little island, but uh, that will certainly make a profound difference if it's uh, enacted. Thank you, um, Tim. Uh, Antonin, one last comment. No, Lauriane? Concluding uh, remarks. <laughs> Maybe just about the vulnerability. So currently there is a different issue regarding vulnerabilities. It's possible to integrate vulnerability of ecosystems in different ways in bioeconomic model, modeling. Um, either it's possible to integrate tipping point processes, for example, thanks to meta mechanistic models, so it's included in the equations. Otherwise, it's possible to, to switch the um, um, solving systems in um, in uh, a probability uh, perspectives. So, yeah, we are we are aware of, about these uh, vulnerability issues, and uh, there is a lot of paper and, and very nice contribution about that. And I think it's a, a crucial uh, issue, of course. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, running out of time, so uh, I want to thank uh, again all of the participants uh, to this. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, let me